Yeah. Okay, good. All right, we're going to call the meeting to order. Okay, we're good? Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. It's Thursday, February 21st, um, 6.30 p.m., and we welcome everyone to the council meeting for the Village of Royal Palm Beach. So please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Diane, can you please let the record show that all members of council are present this evening? Yes, ma'am. And as I said, it's already February 21st. The year just started, no? All right, 2019, it's, time is just going by. All right. Anyway, we're gonna start out with reports this evening. I'd like to give an update to the council and to the citizens on the Transportation Planning Agency's uh, meeting that we had this morning. A couple of key uh, areas of, of, uh, I'd like, of information I'd like to share with you. Um, I guess, Ray, you know about this. Uh, tomorrow's the last day for cities to submit their applications for the uh, local small size initiatives, I think is what they call it. Of okay. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Of course, he's on the, he's on the task force. All right. So, so he knows. He knows. Chris, I, I, Chris, do I get a thumbs up here or what? Okay. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I would be remiss if we inadvertently didn't get our, our pitch in, and I don't want to get an email asking me why <laughs> we didn't do it. Okay, good. So that was one of the items. The other one was the, as I've been speaking to you for, I guess, a, over a year now, the, the transition plan that was put in motion about, about a year or so ago, maybe a little bit more, to move the TPA to becoming an independent agency and not uh, dependent in, uh, in terms of being dependent on the county any longer. Uh, the last time I reported the timeline was that the, uh, within a, I think it was March or April, they were going to start construction on the new uh, uh, office location for the TPA. Um, but those dates are going to be moved. In fact, we're probably gonna have to move construction starting as late as August of this year which would mean that they would not get into their new office space until maybe November, December. Why is this? Well, apparently, uh, the TPA executive director had received guidance uh, a month or so ago that the funding required to do the upfront construction work um, would be allocated and available in the time frame that was needed. He found out, I guess, about a week ago that that is no longer true Apparently the state had overcommitted what they had available for that time frame. So because of timing and the window, um, th those funds won't be available when we thought they were gonna be available. So that pushes back the timeline on construction and moving in. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that and see if anything can be done to improve that. Uh, Palm Tran uh, gave an update and essentially, uh, uh, Councilman Hamera and I were just t talking about it. There were some issues that went on that basically freed up some funds uh, that was earmarked for a different project, and that project is not going to happen now. Instead, the funds are going to be allocated to a project that will provide um, uh, uh, the ability to create smart passes, uh, smart cards, so that when you're riding on any of the Palm Tran or, or uh, Broward County Mass Transit or uh, Tri-Rail, this smart card will give you the ability to move from, from you know, service provider to service provider and not have to transact do any transactions with, 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 um, with money. Uh, we think the big picture, this is a, a, if they get this project done, and, they, and then, as they said they would, and they said they had the funding now to get the project completed, is a tremendous step forward because it makes it a lot easier to take advantage of connections between different transportation systems spanning from uh, as far as, as Indian uh, River down all the way down to Miami. So we, that's a good thing and that was uh, discussed and approved today by, the, by the, uh, the board for them to be able to move, move forward with that with the funding. Just to put it in the context, the project is gonna cost about $6 million and of that amount, about 5.7 million is being provided by TPA to get that, that project done. So, God bless you. 
Go for three? There we go. God bless you. <laughs> you okay? Yes. okay? Anyway, so that was, that was, as I said, looking at, from a big picture perspective, the fact that we're, if we're, if we're trying to move the dial to say let's, let's create more opportunities in encouraging the use of public transportation, let's improve those services so that people have an option of saying, I don't need to take my car, I could leave it home, and I could take public transportation and it'll work for me. So this is part of the bigger picture of making that happen. It's one of the elements that need to be in place. With that, I think that was pretty much it that we had uh, at the meeting this morning. And I'll turn it over to you, Jan. Nothing to report, Mayor. OK, good. Jeff. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. We had a February Education Advisory Board meeting um, week ago, and uh, we had the spotlight on H.L. Johnson Elementary School. Uh, we had the uh, student chorus there performing, and they were outstanding. And um, the principal, Jennifer Mikowski, gave us kind of an update on what's going on in the school. They have 756 students right now. Uh, they are an A-rated school, and they have a gifted program, among other things. Uh, one of the other uh, activities they talked about was the STEAM program, of course, adding art to STEM. And and that program, remembering again that we're, we're talking about elementary school, is, is, is really remarkable. They've got a very engaged uh, PTO, uh, which, which helps them out with uh, uh, supplies that uh, they, they can't seem to afford through their normal budgeting system and other activities. So that PTO plays a, a really important role. Uh, but they were also talking about some initiatives that they have ongoing. Writing, um, I've, I've always heard that... Um, uh, one can think more clearly through the point of a pen, and apparently that seems to apply even in elementary school. And they say if, if your kids can write about something, that demonstrates that they really do understand it. So they, they work very hard, very early with kids uh, to, um, to encourage them to, to write and to demonstrate and develop that, that skill. They also do a lot of work with the kids on um, critical thinking and problem solving. And elementary school debating, which I thought was kind of interesting, and they said you'd be really surprised at the level that these kids can take it to. So H.L. Johnson Elementary School was, like I say, in the spotlight. We did also have the uh, school board representative, Marsha Andrews, talk to us. Uh, this was on the eve of the uh, Parkland uh, shooting that took place on February the 14th uh, last year. And, of course, she talked about a lot of the uh, public, uh, school safety activities that are funded by the ad valorem tax increase that was approved, and she thanked everybody for that, uh, and talked a good bit about the additional police officers, uh, the additional guidance and, and mental health counselors, and of course some of the physical changes that they're making to the school campuses, including fencing and single access controls and things of that nature. So uh, that was uh, a particular noteworthy uh, update on what's going on in, in that regard. Uh, and then while I'm on the subject of education, of course, our school scholarship activities are, are moving forward. I think we had 32 scholarship applications that we received for our 10 uh, scholarships. And so that's a pretty good number. It's manageable. And the next step in that process will be for the Education uh, Advisory Board Scholarship Committee uh, to uh, down select, if you will, from the 32 to 16 is the number that they're shooting for, and those finalists, those 16, will be invited to interview with the um, scholarship committee on Saturday, April the 27th. And then, of course, out of those 16, there will be 10 selected, and those scholarships will be awarded at village council meeting on Thursday, May 16th. So that's all I have. Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The only report I have is uh, I had the opportunity last week to go over to the newly renovated cultural center and uh, see the community band concert, which w was great and it's phenomenal. I'd encourage anyone to get out to watch uh, the concerts they do, but they were what what struck me was they were so appreciative of how nice the facility was and to have use of it and to practice. And I, I don't. I didn't count up, but they, they thanked the village many, many times over <laughs> and uh, look forward to a much a, a long and illustrious career in the newly renovated uh, cultural center. So it's, it, it's getting used and it's uh, definitely appreciated. That's good. And it was a very good turnout, too. It was, wasn't standing room only, but it was pretty full. So. Okay, good. 
Actually, I have a question regarding your report from the TPA. Did they talk about um, delig uh, having space allotted for ride sharing parking? So in some other cities, what they do is they'll have it close to the expressway and say you can park here and then ride share from there. I know there's one out in Wellington, but that's not one of the, one things, of the things they, they spoke about. about today. But that is something that is a topic that has come up from time to time. Okay. Uh, but there was one of the things they, they that they talked about on that side. That. Okay, so um, I just have we have several events coming up in the village. Uh, in fact, tomorrow is baseball opening day over at Bob Marcella Park, and that starts at six thirty. And then from there, you can head on over to Commons Park because we have our concert and gourmet truck starting at seven o'clock. So they have the band out there. We have the rededication of the cultural center, and that's on the twenty eighth at five o'clock. And I believe um, hors d'oeuvres and refreshments are going to be served, so we can come for dinner. <laughs> no, no, don't or jersey. Don't, don't advertise dinner. Come right. on, <laughs> you will. Un, re, that's not the right expectation. <laughs> I thought I'd try. Uh, and then seafood festival we also have coming up in March. So that's coming back again, March 16th from 11 to 8, and then March 17th from 11 to 6, and that's over at Commons Park again. Thank you. Okay, good, great. Yes, I have one thing. The um, Pop Warner, our national champion Pop Warner team. Yeah is wanting to do a ring ceremony um, and they're, they're, they're wanting to do it in the grandness of our grand ballroom in the cultural center. Um, Lou has, has, has talked to me about this uh, recently and, and they would like to have the, cultural, the grand ballroom in the cultural center for three hours in one Sunday in March. They don't have a date picked out. Uh, we did check the schedule, it's not available. And what I, what I would like to do, we collect Money from the from the from the people who sign up for uh, Pop Warner that are outside the village limits. The fee is made up of two parts. One part is their the, um, is two hundred dollars, and that goes to the provider. Uh, for residents outside of the village limits, they pay a, a twenty percent surcharge. We collected twenty six hundred and forty dollars from that from this group. So I would like authorization from council to use a portion of that twenty six hundred dollars to pay their their. Uh, use of the cultural center for their ring ceremony. Okay, do we need to take a motion or is that consent? Okay, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> you've heard the, the, the request. Is there a motion? No, a discussion. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make the motion that we, give me the number again, $2,600? That we use a Allocation. portion of the $2,600 yeah, to pay their, their um, Rent, uh, rental uh, fee for the cultural center for a Sunday night in March for three hours. Okay, so moved. Second. All right. We have a motion. We don't have a date yet. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any comment? Discussion? Who is the second? I was second. No comment discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So we have no opposed. Diane, please show that the special <coughs> request for the funding uh, on behalf of the, the Super Bowl team, I mean the championship <laughs> team, <laughs> uh, to use the, the um, uh, be able to use the, the, the culture center. Now you said the dates are available, are open that they're looking for? Yeah, the, 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 there okay. it's available and you okay, just good. have to pick a date. It'll be one Sunday in, in March. Oh, good. Okay. Thank Listen, you very much. That's this, winning the Super Bowl doesn't happen every, every day, right? <laughs> every, <laughs> so <laughs> they've been our first ones to get that far and we're proud of them. That's right. We already did with the, the quote unquote White House visit, so now it's the <laughs> <laughs> they have to have their they should have their, their special night. Okay. Anything that's else? All I, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank, thank you very much. All right, then that will um, Jennifer. No report, thank you. Okay, gotcha. That will now conclude our report at this time. If anyone has a petition to present to the council, now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing then the uh, agenda for petitions. Does anyone here who would like to make a statement uh, to the council on an item that is not on the agenda tonight? Not on the agenda. I have no cards, but that's okay now. All right. Uh, anyone here would like to make a comment on an item on the consent agenda? <laughs> <laughs> a comment about the minutes from the last, <laughs> from the last meeting. <laughs> okay, seeing none, I will close public comment on non-agenda items and on consent agenda mm -hmm. items. And with that, Diana, I'll ask you to present the consent agenda. Yes, Mayor, yeah. I will. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one, approval of the minutes of the council regular meeting of February 7th, 2019. Nicely done. <laughs> a motion? A motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? <clears throat> Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diana, please let the record show that the consent agenda was approved 5-0. 
We'll go to agenda item R1, which tonight is a presentation and an update from the Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, the annual report by, delivered by uh, District Chief William Riley. Sir, you're on. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> it's not up there yet? It's up here. Oh, no. There it is. Okay. Magic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Better? Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks. I was getting on to his. Uh, it'll be a brief presentation and then I'll entertain any questions uh, you have on it and we'll go through it and, and see. Uh, you don't need to see pictures of me. <laughs> I'd take that out. They keep including that in there. Um, this is just an overview of the alarm activity we've had for the year. Um, obviously, this is the same thing it repeats every year. The fire rescue's major call volume is medical calls. And you could definitely see it by the percentages. Um, if you look down as uh, the hazard materials, some, some of those are mitigated by the, the stations here in the village. Other ones are mitigated by special ops that'll come over from Benoist Farms Road or even come down from Jupiter if it's a large incident. So those are all handled regionally. Um, we had 70 fires and that the fires are including from car fires, structure fires, and even down to miscellaneous fires, just sheds, things like that, and even brush fires. Um, investigations are just what they sound like and um, the uh, one of the things here to I'm going to clarify a little bit is where it references um, vehicles slash boat accidents and when we back and looked at that the the main point of that is that those are vehicle accidents the um, we ended up having only water if you look on the top the one water related incident for the year um, injury that also was our own our one water related accident for the year so, you know, that's, I'm going to get them to correct that in the report for future, future years so it doesn't look like we're having 406 possible boating incidents in the, in the village. That's, it's not accurate. It's one. So. <laughs> Our call volume, um, you can see that basically we stayed almost consistent with the previous year total of calls. Um, our response time has gone down a little bit and actually in our average. But that's pretty much where we run about. It's a, anywhere from a uh, 10 to 15 second per year up or down, but it stays pretty consistent throughout the, the years. Um, like we talked about, that's, you know, we run a lot of car accidents. You have Okeechobee Boulevard running through here. We have Southern Boulevard running through your boundaries and Royal Palm Beach Boulevard and State Road 7. A lot of traffic, and you know that driving around during the day. So that's, that these things are gonna happen. Um, structure fires. Um, when we have those, I report those back to the, uh, to the village just to give you a heads up on any kind of um, um, code enforcement issues you may have with them or anything like that. And those were reported under the, uh, the 70 that we ran. Um, fire stations. You have the two stations, Station 28 located right behind us here and Station 29 <laughs> over in Counterpoint. The apparatus. The only things we've had changed in the past year um, for um, apparatuses, we've had the uh, EMS captain's truck has been replaced. But if you look at the conditions of our vehicles, uh, the, the fleet we have, we can be proud of it driving around in your village. It really looks good. They're maintained very well. There's a brief slide on the, uh, the, um, our facility over on uh, Vista Parkway that maintains them. But it's, they're really well, well kept. Um, for Station 29, we still have a, uh, a truck company over there, so we have the bucket, bucket ladder and a rescue running out of there. Um, operations, and that's pretty much what you guys see as a daily basis of us running around the, the village and running around the county. That's the predominant of our workload, but it will go through briefly some of the other services we provide. If you look here, special operations, the, they run out of our special ops team the closest is over on Benoist Farms Road, but we have two full teams, the other one's up in Jupiter. And then on top of that for hazmat calls, the county participates in a regional hazmat response, which also includes City of West Palm's hazmat team, Boca Del Rey's hazmat team. So it's a combined effort to provide that service throughout the, the county. On top of the hazmat, we, reply, we supply, you know, through our special ops, dive rescue, confined space, high angle, trench, all the, the technical rescue disciplines. Medical services. And that's something interesting of, over the last couple of years. It's uh, typically medical services have been emergency medical services. You know, the, the uh, ambulance is coming out and providing care. One of the big things we've done over the last couple of years, and it's really been spearheaded by Chief Ellis, 
is the uh, mobile integrated help. That's a, basically it's a service that when the crews go out and identify, there's a person that has, a, has an issue that, you know, a lot of times are identified because we're going out there a lot. And it's things that when we, we bring it back to this group, which has a, um, has a, um, a counselor and community paramedics that'll go out, we, bring, we identify an issue with, the, with this resident, and they'll go out and do a visit afterward and see what we can do to help solve the problem that a lot of times is it's a problem at home that the reason they keep coming back is it could be anywhere from prescription issues, it could be from um, uh, grab bars in a home, a lot of fall injuries, things like that, things that can be addressed in the home to stop them from having to constantly go back to the hospital and then go back and just say, it starts to try to break that cycle. And this is, is this focused specifically for our senior citizens? What's that? Is this a, a focus specifically for? Oh our... no, it's for, it's basically if we, if our crews identify okay. any, any um, demographic that's having this issue, it's granted it's gonna be um, identified in a residence, but if they identify that, then this group, they'll, they'll make a referral to um, emergency services and they'll send the counselor out and the crew out and it's separate to the crews. It's not the crews in your fire stations that's doing this. We've, um, we've hired a social, medical social worker that's full-time position, and then we also have paramedics that are working on, the days, on their days off to provide this service with them to go out and provide this, this um, outreach care. And this is something you're seeing around the country. It's a, it's a new initiative going on over the last couple of years, but fortunately, we're actually in the forefront of this with Chief Ellis's efforts on it. Okay. So. Is that what you call your MIH program? Yeah, mobile integrated mobile health. Integrated, okay. <coughs> That's good. And, That's and, good. and real, reality is the hospitals appreciate it too because you know you look around. We're, the, if anyone's been to the emergency rooms lately, they're busy. And anything we could do to help, you know, take the burden off of them. And also the fact is, it's taking the burden off of fire rescue to have our units available for other calls. Right. Sure. So it's it's a it's a win win for everyone and especially a win for the residents. <clears throat> Air rescue, and the reason we include this, granted, you can see by their lettering on it, the healthcare district has the helicopters, but we provide the RNs and the paramedics, um, firefighters that are on those helicopters. Palm Beach International, we provide the services out on the runway. Those are our, our um, personnel that run the aircraft rescue for Palm Beach <coughs> International. Training and safety. Again, that's another thing that we, we where Palm Beach County Fire Rescue is able to provide as a regional training facility. You go down off a of pike road, you, you can't miss it when you're getting off the turnpike. Mm -hmm. And our, our stations all over the county use it. And in fact, tonight, Station 28 has got a unit down there doing evolutions on the tower. Because we don't have, you know, granted, if you look around, we have buildings here, but nobody wants us pulling hose and climbing up and down all over their buildings. But without the facility like that, we don't have the, the availability to train on these kind of things. Support services are briefly discussed over off of Vista Parkway. We have our own um, uh, crew of mechanics and do our own fleet maintenance over there from everything. And you can see in the back of that picture is one of the crash trucks from the airport in there being serviced. Alarm office. Um, they've answered over the past last year, and last year they answered 200, up to 200,000 911 calls in the alarm center. And basically, that's our dispatch center, but that's also the county's 911. When you call 911, that's where you're calling, the one down off the of military, and that's our dispatch center. And again, we staff that with the dispatchers. Granted, it's not the law enforcement side, it's the fire rescue, and it's fire and the uh, medical when you call up. Uh, the other thing that was introduced in this past year is text to 911. That's a big thing. Back in June of last year, that's, that actually went live, and now you can text 911, and you're going to get in communication with a dispatcher. And if you could see all the different implications of that, it could very well be a case where you can't talk and you want to get a message out. So that's that's pretty big, and that was due to a system upgrade. Do you ever feel with the in terms of the volume of texting versus the traditional model and is it a net increase or is it kind of just distributed? I'm going to make a note to, to look into that because I haven't asked that question, but it's actually a, a good question to, under, to know okay. at least. But yeah, I just know it's, it's pretty new, but I would imagine it, you'll see it more and more. So uh, I think it would take a little bit of the volume off. Bureau of Safety Services is our inspections, um, the Inspection Bureau, um, investigations for fires, things like that. 
and the um, investigators are also deputized. So they're they're actually they've gone through the police academy in in conjunction with the sheriff's department. Is this the the um, the, the activity that also when you go to um, places where there's a gathering of people and there's a limit on how many people yep. they should have and yeah. Yeah, so we, we end up, then that's that again, that's the because we it's an internal service we provide. Our crews will go out on calls or some to nightclubs or whatever, and they'll run the call and they say, Well, this this doesn't look right. They may not have the clicker in their hand, but they say it just doesn't look right. So they'll end up reaching out through the battalion chief and they'll make the call and then we'll at least look. The goal is never to, to stop anyone's fun or anything, but it's also to keep everything safe. And we've ran into that time to time that we've had to address. Um, occupancy levels okay. because of that. <clears throat> Fire inspections, um, total inspections for the year is 1,452. Uh, community educa education, uh, you, I hope you see that when you have activities here in the village, we're at these activities. Our <laughs> pub ed division, once um, anyone reaches out to them, they bring um, personnel out to do that. We. We love bringing our fire trucks out to do them. Our, our firefighters love doing that. We love doing tours of the station. So it's, you know, firefighters, that's always been our thing. So we, we truly enjoy supporting all the activities here in the village. And well, I told you it was brief. Um, with that, uh, please, any, any other questions? Any questions from members of the council? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it. Richard, who was first? I, I, I just wanted to, to clarify that um, the water-related incidents that we have, that includes things like drowning and, you know, if you're injured on a boat or something like that, because one is, is phenomenal with... Yeah, they didn't, we didn't have a, well, it wasn't, it's, it's different than drowning. Okay. It's a, it's, a, uh, an, it's a incident on a body of water, but it wouldn't be because... It wouldn't be in a pool, though. No. Oh, no, okay, so this that, is... No, just, unfortunately, no okay. numbers. I, I don't have numbers. We can't, we okay. don't have that there, but... Yeah, because that looked yeah. way low to me, and I thought, oh, oh, wow, that's phenomenal. If we only had one drowning, um, that would and, be great. But, and I had to do more research, actually, when I was looking at those numbers because the we don't dispatch spe specifically anymore for a, a vehicle separate to a boat accident okay they're a, a it's a vehicle accident a boat is a vehicle on right. the water yep. so what I ended up doing was I did some research on the other, other reporting system and found that when I looked for water I came up with one water related incident and okay. then I also came up with one water injury so I, my assumption is they go like this, and and that's still pretty low. If that's if that's the case, that that's a great number. But thank you very much. And then you still fund the drowning coalition of Palm Beach County. That's still under your yeah. We have part of we it. have yeah. a, we have drowning so, prevention that, at, right. in our pub ed. Okay. And then how does when we were talking about the water related injury, how does that compare to last year? If we had the um, one, we had six last year. Okay, so that's really good. Then year, we're down. So it's actually Perfect. gone down. Um, and then when you were talking about the medical calls and the medical service, the mobile integrated health. The purpose of that is to help decrease the chronic 911 calls by specific individuals. Well, so it's, that it's that, that's, in, you're better, I'd rather address it as saying it's, it's it, the, the focus is to, to provide a service to the to residents and the patients to make their life better, help them in, in their situation. The side effect is it takes the, the burden off of the units to respond multiple times to an address to be available for other ad, other calls. With that, okay. So it has a side effect that benefits us, but in reality, is the, it's a multi-pronged, but the obviously the number one goal is to provide a service. Thanks. And then the last question I had was then, um, going into Palm Beach County versus having our independent fire station, um, you don't foresee that there's a, ever an issue when now with the new developments coming on, I always hear that is like, oh, how's the d response time going to be if we have all these extra homes? But well, that's and that's and I can I could truly speak from firsthand knowledge because remember I was a uh, firefighter with the Village of Royal Palm when we had our own fire department, and the the issues we had back then was and it was Chief Combs did a great job of running the department, but when our two stations and at that time was a total of. I was one of two people over at the other station and there was five over here or seven people in the whole village. You had no depth of service. When we, when something, when they were out, granted the county was there to help, but you had to ask. And the, the difference is, is when you say, well, is, do we have something in place to ask for help? Well, that's the nice part. If you look the, the depth of service we provide, everything around the village is still Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. So there's no ask. It's just a matter of if a unit's in counterpoint, 
running a call and there's a call over on Southern Boulevard, the CAD system says 34 is closer, right off of one of these farms. So they, get, they hit the call. So that's, that's a nice part of not having to ask for help. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are you next? Yes. So um, Chief, the, um, the importance of, of training is, uh, can't be overstated, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like the military, you know, you spend a lot of time preparing for and then finally engaging in kind of a thing. Um, but it's, it seems to be different in fire and rescue from the point of view of you wind up dealing with a wide variety of, of different kind of situations, new materials, uh, new structures and that kind of stuff. Uh, how, do, how do you all keep up with, with all that? We're, we're very fortunate to have a, a training division that's really on top of things. We, they, there's constantly stuff coming out to us on, on hybrid vehicles, all different things like that. Down at the, the training facility, when you drive by there, you see the nice big tower, which is great for those type of activities. We can do training from residential fires all the way to doing high-rise fires. But what you may not also see is up on the hill, there's a three-story burn building. So we actually put fires in the building, in these rooms, and it's structured out like a residential, three-story residential. And we put fires going in there and the crews pull hose in. They're actually dealing with actual fire conditions, the visibility conditions, all that. And that's a regular thing our crew does. And it's, it takes a lot for our training division to coordinate 49 stations and almost 1,500 personnel coming in and doing that, but they do it. And again, the example is I've got a crew from the station right behind there down there tonight. Because that, that, that facility is running pretty much, we've got units training from first thing in the morning till sometimes 11, 12 o'clock at night. So as we see more and more of these electric vehicles and the batteries and those kinds of things, I'm sure you all are keeping up with, with that. That's, yeah. that's quickly emerging and it's... Yeah. Well, that's been, it's been something actually that's been on the, on the radar for us for quite a while. I, had, I bought a, a 2006 Prius when it was, a, it was in 2006, and my car was one I brought to headquarters for them to do some training on where the disconnects and all that. So we've been, we've been looking at these things for many years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for this report. I really, um, you all are doing such a great job. A couple of questions. I'm curious, you, you mentioned high traffic um, intersections in the village. I'm curious as to which one is the, the most dangerous. Uh, I, I don't have that information. I just know from the same as everyone else does is driving around that there's, there's traffic. And granted, it's all peak times, yeah. you know, different times of day. When I'm coming into work in the morning, I'm seeing all the traffic heading out of the village. And so it's, it's, there's a lot of traffic, but no, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have, have that type of information. No problem. And also the um, community engagement, the community education pieces are really, really great for our, our village residents. And we know that we have residents who are curious and, and want to get involved. Um, and we have citizens who um, have volunteered on the um, sheriff's side. Is there any opportunities for our residents to volunteer with Fire and Rescue? Um, on, there, there is. But unfortunately, the only volunteer aspect we have with fire rescue is you have to be at least trained up to a volunteer firefighter level. And we have the reserve battalion, basically, as they, they come out on structure fires and they're volunteers and they put gear on and they actually assist with firefighting, they assist with overhaul and all that. But we don't have, in fire rescue, we don't have a, um, a program for non-high risk volunteering. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, no further questions? Great, Chief. Thanks again. Great report. Continue to do the good, the good work you guys are doing. And uh, that new program, the MIH, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, sounds and, great. Yeah, you'll, yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll hear more about that. We'd like that. to hear more on how so, that progresses. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really excellent. going somewhere. Okay. So, thank great. you very much. Thanks so thank much, you. Chief. Thank you. Okay, agenda item, agenda item R2 is a public hearing for approval of application number 18-58, an application by Lenar Holmes, LLC, and adoption of resolution number 18-21. The applicant is seeking site plan modifications for the Crestwood North Plan Unit Development, situated on 154.10 acre parcel of land, located at 980 Crestwood Boulevard at the northwest quadrant of Crestwood Boulevard in the M1 Canal. This is a quasi-judicial uh, uh, item, so okay. Thank you. Um, for number two and number three on the regular agenda, they're both involving the same applicant. So if you're going to be speaking on this item or number three, if you could raise your hand for me and I'll swear you in. 
Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and not <laughs> the truth? Say, I do. Thank you. <laughs> that was funny. Um, <laughs> all right, now I'll turn to council and ask <laughs> if, if you all have any ex parte disclosures on number two and number three. No. Yeah, great. no. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, this is a this is an application for architectural approval for a single family development on three tracts of land totaling 154 acres to be lo located at the at 980 Crestwood Boulevard, the northwest quadrant of Crestwood Boulevard and the M1 Canal. The applicant is seeking architectural approval to change the architecture of the clubhouse, guardhouse, mail kiosk, bus shelter, and entry signs for the. Mm -hmm. um, for the Lennar Homes development. Um, and this architectural style that they're going to is the transitional architectural style. As you can see here on the slide, the top picture or illustration is the new architectural style, and the, um, the bottom one is the, the currently approved architectural style. And those features, uh, the kiosk, the clubhouse, and the guardhouse will match the tradition, the transitional architectural style. Um, here is a illustration of the new signs that the applicant is proposing. Um, the one on the bottom is what is currently um, approved. The Planning Zoning Commission considered this application on January 22nd, 2019 and recommended approval by vote of five to zero and staff is recommending approval of this application. And I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would the applicant like to make any comments? Good no evening, definitely. for the record, Jennifer Vale with WGI, agent for the applicant, Lennar Holmes. Um, we're here to answer any questions, but um, I believe back in October, um, we were here before you with the transitional architectural style changes to some of the model homes, <clears throat> and this is in keeping with that and moving the, the other facilities with that same architectural style, but happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I do not have any comment cards in this agenda item, but if anyone here would like to comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, I will close public comment then on agenda item R2, and we'll go to council starting with... I just have, and it can be for either one of you, but the, if you go back to the signs, the entryway signs, and you're proposing them one on either side of the entrance from the Crestwood location, That's correct? correct? And then what is the height differential from... Um. <laughs> That one, so what the original one was proposed versus the new one, the top one that's, because I see the, I'm assuming that's a five foot seven average person standing in front right. there. I, think, <laughs> um. I believe the height was fairly the same. I think it was the length that was actually. Was the difference. Was okay. the difference. Because I couldn't see the dimensions on, from the lower part to the upper part. And we can see is that it's, uh, is it 10 and a half feet by, or no, those are the letters. <coughs> so what is the height and the width of the new signs. To this point right here, right. it is showing 11 feet, four inches. Okay. And then I believe this dimension is going to be showing from here to the top. Well, you know what, let me, let me try something real quick, just one, if you bear with me. Or just, yeah, if you tell me the height of the letters and we can do the math. See if I can zoom in a little bit. Oops. Yes. Six, fifteen point fifteen feet eight inches. Okay, and that's the total height. And then, do you have the? You're saying then to the top lighting on the original proposed site that that's the same, roughly. God oh, bless sure. you. It's roughly the same height then. The yes. Okay. Thanks. And then the width. I'm sorry. And the width you said is what you were really changing. Right, it's the length. Um, the length. The, the previous approval had actually two different sizes of signs. Okay. Um, the one that's on the east side of the entry was the larger of the two. Right. The one on the west was actually set back and on the kind of the, the peninsula in the lake. Um, as we were going through the permitting and the development, realized that that sign's really going to be blocked by all of the landscape and berming. <laughs> so that's why we proposed to move it up to the 
to the front closer to Crestwood Boulevard for visibility. For visibility. And we're mirroring Anchoring the two. Anchoring both sides. So Correct. they will be identical sides. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's it? Yes. No, okay. Actually, I <clears throat> uh, any other questions, comments from the council? If not, I'll look for a motion. I move to approve uh, regular agenda item number two. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R2 was approved 5 0. <laughs> agenda item 5 3 is a public hearing for approval of application number 18 0057. An application by Lamar Homes LLC. The applicant is seeking <clears throat> architectural approval to modify the approved architecture for several buildings, modify the landscape plan, and entry features including signage for the Crestwood North Plan unit development. Situated on a pro on 154.10 acre parcel of land located at 980 Crestwood Boulevard, at the northwest corner quadrant of uh, Crestwood Boulevard in the M1 Canal, <coughs> and they've already been sworn in. So, okay. right. thank you, Mayor. Um, the applicant is seeking a site plan modification approval in order to uh, relocate the project entry signs from the middle of the lake on the west side of the property and located closer to Crestwood Boulevard. In addition, the applicant is adding sliding gates for maintenance access to the western and southern buffer areas adjacent to the Saratoga Pines development. Also, the applicant is proposing changes to the previous approved landscape plan in order to change species and quantities of certain plant material. These changes are related to relocation of the entry sign and due to certain plant species not being available in sizes and quantities to meet the village code requirements. Um, and these changes do meet the um, relevant Village Code. The Planning and Zoning Con Commission considered this application on January 22nd, 2019, recommended approval by a vote of five to zero, and staff is recommending approval of this application. And I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Once again, would the applicant like to make any comments? And again, Jennifer Bale, WGI, agent for the applicant. Um, just a note of clarification. I think when the agenda items were read off, staff, yeah, they were flipped in presentation. This should have been first? This is number three. This is number three was technically the architecture, and number two was the site plan, but um, same project, same. Got it. Um, but again, happy to answer any questions. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I have no comment cards on this agenda item R3, but if anyone would like to comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment on agenda item R3. Take comments from council. If there are no comments from council, then I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda item R3. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R3 was approved 5-0. Good luck. Thank you very much. Good. Okay, agenda item R4 is the approval of the yearly calendar. Uh, approval of council yearly, yearly calendar. and. This is an agenda item that we decided to discuss at the last meeting that we would have uh, up for discussion this evening. Before I turn it over to the village manager, I just want to put some more context around this because there are a lot of interesting discussions I think that went on after the uh, uh, last meeting. Uh, first of all, uh, let me give you some facts, uh, historical facts. The village was incorporated in 1959. From 1959 to 1993, the village only had, the council only met once a month. So some 30 odd years that they met once a month and that was adequate for the volume of work. Uh, interesting thing happened in 1993. Uh, the market was booming and development was booming. And there was a lot of development and application activity going on which necessitated then in 1993 for the village to move to having uh, two times a month meetings, the first Thursday and the, and the, and the third Thursday. Um, I, another interesting bit of information was, from what I could determine, and hopefully I'm not wrong in this, there's only one member uh, that was present and then going back as far back as 1985, when the council was meeting once a month, uh, that is still with us, uh, former council member David Swift. So he was there part of the council that was meeting once a month. And uh, 
But it made sense that they, they moved that, that uh, to twice a month when the volume of work and, and, and development that was going on in the village uh, was at its height. Um, now we find ourselves in the year 2019, we're really, I have to say, built out 98%, maybe 99%, depending on what day of the week you look at it. Uh, and the volume of activity and, and applications um, for developmental review, et cetera, is just not there anymore, um, which uh, drove me to look at our meeting schedules. Um, I think what we suggested and talked about before was uh, <clears throat> creating the first Thursday of the month, using that as an option to, to have maybe workshops or, if necessary, uh, not what we call non-regular agenda item meetings. So we would have our regular council meetings on the third Thursday and leave the first Thursday open for non-regular meetings or emergency meetings or workshops or whatever the case may be. So I just wanted to set that context about what we're really trying to accomplish here and, um, and what the historical reality has been uh, for the village in that, in that regard. And with that, now the, the village manager has a proposed schedule to share with us. Thank you, Mayor. As, a, as <clears throat> stated, the, the council is required under our village code of ordinances that they meet no less than once a month, and it states even on the first or third Thursday of the month. Uh, as you stated, up until 1993, they were meeting uh, on one of those days, and then when a meeting was needed, either for public hearings, workshops, um, or organizational meetings, they would meet on the other day. Uh, what I've proposed for you here uh, is basically that same same program, and and what I have is is kind of all the meetings I I thought that the council would need between now and the end of the year, the end of December. Um, as you know, we we our first meeting in July we typically have as a budget as a budget workshop. If there's business that needs to be accomplished, we also have combined that with the meeting if needed. Um, we look at, we're looking at this schedule that if, if we have things that need to get to the council, um, then we would have that first meeting in Thursday. Uh, I know I'm not showing a first meeting in March, but we do have things in the pipeline that would require us to have a first yeah, meeting in sure. March. Okay. Um, so, so, but this is what we are looking at phasing to, phasing the council meetings to, with working, with kind of placing the workshops towards the end of the year on, on, on an as needed basis after our, our citizens uh, summit and after our strategic plan is in place, and if there's things that come out of those those meetings that we would we would put them in workshops at you know at the last half of the year, so that's the schedule that that I was proposing um, as a minimum, and would look for council approval on this on doing this. Okay, I do not have any comment cards on agenda item um, R four and. If anyone from the public would like to comment, now would be the time. Seeing none, then I'm going to close public comment on agenda item R4. And Jeff, you're up. Uh, thank you. I've talked with a number of residents uh, about this, and some of the feedback I got was <clears throat> one of the starting point was one that I think we all would agree with is um, having a meeting for the sake of having a meeting is usually not a good idea, um, unless you have something in in your intention is to actually accomplish something in particular. Um, on the flip side, what I've, what I've been hearing is um, each one of the meetings that we currently have scheduled, first and third Thursday of the month, is an opportunity for the public to approach us on items as the mayor offers up, uh, either on the agenda or not on the agenda. And we just recently had an experience where um, an item was brought to us by a fairly large number of members of the public, uh, and my concern would be fewer meetings creates fewer opportunities for that kind of public engagement. <clears throat> and that, that's not just my concern, actually it comes from a number of people that I've talked to about this. So if we were to use the first meeting of the month, though, for something like a workshop, um, and within that setting, uh, provide an opportunity for public engagement, um, I, I think that might, might be a reasonable way to uh, address the concern about fewer opportunities to actually engage the, the council. I, I think our policy has clearly been whenever we meet, we give the public a chance to address us. Uh, 
Uh, and I think, mm -hmm. um, believe me, a lot of uh, cities don't do this. We open up our meetings with, right. by saying, hey, if you want to share something with us that's not on the agenda, come on down. So we would certainly continue to do that. That would not be something that we would go away from, absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I kind of echoed uh, council members. I, I haven't heard anyone say anything to me either way on what, but uh, to me, one of the things that makes rural Palm Beach rural Palm Beach is the fact that I think probably all of us up here, I know I'm extremely open. I mean, if people want to contact us by email or by telephone, that access is always available. However, there are situations, as Jeff pointed out, you know, someone wants to come to a meeting. They can't talk to all five of us at once or at least address all five of us at once because that would be a sunshine violation. And reducing the numbers of opportunities for people to come out, I, I don't really, I don't know, something inside of me doesn't think that's a good thing. I'd rather have more opportunities for people to come out and say things. However, on the flip side, I understand, hey, if the business is slowing down, I mean, there's no, you know, mad rush. This has been going on according to my calculation from what the mayor said for the past 26 years. This is the way we've done everything. And I do know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Ray, within the past six months, there has been one meeting where we had nothing and it was canceled. So one in the past half a year, okay, that's just one and we kind of cancel three anyway. Um, if it becomes a recurrent problem or something we see going forward, then, then I could see perhaps revisiting it. Um, but at, at, at this point, I, I would rather keep that, you know, everyone knows if they've got an issue, you know, they could come and contact the council on the first because some people might not make it because of whatever it's sports or because they work or whatever. They don't have the opportunity on certain nights to come before the council, but they might on the third Thursday. And if we run into this situation like we have in the past six months that hey, we don't have any business, there's nothing coming before the council. To me, it makes more sense to say, okay, here's our set, and if we don't have anything going on, then canceling it as opposed to not setting it at all and then getting into the situation of, well, a resident comes to me and says, hey, Rich, I want to come to the council, I have a, a complaint. Well, Am, am I going to have the ability to say, okay, we'll come to the first meeting if, if we've canceled that meeting? How is, if, if the village manager can explain how that process would work if one of us individual council members gets a request for someone who wants to come to the council and address us, but we don't have a meeting scheduled, would I or Selena or any one of us five be able to say, okay, I want a meeting. Do we unilaterally set the meeting, or no, you, how would that minute. how would that happen if if this were to come you into play? It? You want me to answer it? I'll answer it. Okay. The, the way our code reads is the mayor can set meetings. Uh, the council right. uh, would have to do it with consensus from the other council. Right. So at it, least it, two other council people. It would have to be all five of us sitting here for a council member to set a meeting. But if the mayor wanted to set a meeting, it would be okay because he's the one who gets to set the meeting. The council the the mayor has within the in the code the mayor can set meetings correct okay. um but, but and, there's another part of your question i wanted to address because i get that question all the time and the response when a person says they want you know they want to come and right. make right. you know talk to the council the response is okay come to the next scheduled meeting whenever that is all right it's it's not that i've for years that's been how our response is yeah you know I, if i know what the top of my head when the next meeting is i will tell them i you know, i'll tell them i'll check the schedule but whatever the next scheduled meeting is, you're certainly welcome to show up. Remember, uh, the, the notion of scheduling a meeting, if we have no gender to review, there's no, per there's no meeting, right? We don't schedule a meeting just somebody, because someone wants to address the council. The answer is, you're free to address us at the next scheduled meeting. And that's, that's the reality. Right, well, but my point would be that everyone should, even if, you know, one of the functions of the government, this local government to me, is, you know, for people to come and petition us and to, to voice their concerns. And whether, you know, there, you can even make an argument, whether we have business or not, we should be holding meetings. I'm not going that far, but, you know, there are people who, you know, okay. come this month, okay, I can't make this meeting. Fred, when's the next meeting? Okay, the next meeting's the end of next month. Oh, no, Riley's got a baseball game. I can't make that one either. So I'm looking at a month span between 
uh, meetings instead of just a two week gap, and and that's just a little further than I well care listen, to go. we're not we're not proposing an arbitrarily cancellation here. I think if you look at the schedule that's been put forth by the village manager, he's he's really addressed I think what the uh, reality scenario is in terms of make sense and. Whenever we have a workshop or whether it's a regular council meeting, we're still going to put, be, uh, have the opportunity to have, take comments from the public if the public has comments. So that doesn't change. Right. Selena? Uh, just looking over it, and I can certainly um, understand different perspectives of this. First of all, I, I wanted to double check. So July, you had on there the first Thursday, but you were going to change it to the second or the first or second week. Yeah, it, July because it could go either because of the Fourth of July. Depends on when the when Fourth hits. It's okay. usually the first or second week of July. And because we already have three months that we don't, we only have one scheduled meeting. I believe when you look at the schedule, it's like five months. I think it's adding two extra months that we don't. We only have one meeting. I would prefer to have this written in stone, uh, not in stone, but now out into the public versus saying, "Oh, there's nothing on the agenda, so now we're canceling the meeting," and then you have a whole herd of residents that want to come through and as we can see it doesn't happen very often uh, also i've been contacted multiple times by various residents from all s different means whether it's a phone call an email knocking on my front door so i don't think there's and we're out in public so i don't think there's any way that there's anything to say somebody doesn't have the opportunity and i don't think the intent is to um, not provide the opportunity, it's still there. And if we need to, because there's a big item coming up and we know, for instance, six months now that there's, there's going to be an agenda item and it's going to cause a lot of feedback before those meetings we have, starting in July, we have two meetings every month. So it's not really that much that we're eliminating if we go off of the schedule. All right. Jan. Yeah. Um, I agree. With Councilwoman uh, Smith, uh, some waste. Um, I do that just to mess with you guys. Too. It's okay. I just want to practice. Yeah. Yeah. Practice. Yeah. Um, there and, and there are looking at the schedule and and publishing this and allowing people to understand this is the schedule going forward. Um, and and most of the folks that I have talked to, I, I, you know, I want to come talk to the council. You're welcome to come. Here's the schedule. There's, I have yet to see an issue that is so timely that um, it can't be fit into this, this schedule um, or any emergency um, that has come forward the, with the exception of a groundswell of people who want to come talk about one particular thing. Mm -hmm as we know they they did about um a month or two ago um with that exception i think the schedule works uh, with that exception if we know and people have called in called a special meeting it, it, exactly that's what i was and we've done that in past years we've had uh, work special meetings where the the number of people was so so large we couldn't do the meeting here and we would Right. The and then we go to the cultural center. Exactly. So yeah, we 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 will continue to to address that as as we have in the past. Absolutely. And I think that would. Yeah. And that is the process that we use for the planning and zoning board. Several years ago, we went to one meeting a month with the planning and zoning board. Um, but there has been months when we've needed more than the one meeting, or we've had to move the that one meeting, and and we do accommodate that and do that. So looking at the schedule here, we're we're talking about 2019, right? January to December? Yes. Okay. And, is that right? But I, I, my understanding, I'm sorry, I just want to clarify. My understanding is, of course, this is for this year, but this is just going to be our schedule going on, right? It's going to be every year this, that this schedule is going to. It's, a it's our set set. Correct. It's, correct. It's, a, it's a template set, you know, right. subject to us modifying it as that's we, why our business dictates. or why it's like we have now, right? Sure. Yeah. The first and third like we do now. This is just supplanting that. Okay, well. So with that thought in mind, um, I'm trying to understand the logic. So let me go back and say one other thing first. I thought I heard you say we are going to do a meeting uh, the first week in March, even though it only shows the third. Right. Okay. Because there's a business requirement. A, time the public hearing, the a public hearing that requires it. Right. We, so we that, have that public be, ads out that we That we would be a change yes. to make to this template. Um, and, and the logic for having only one meeting in June I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I'm not anticipating a business need to have one the first week of June. 
Okay. And, and so we, we're not scheduling even a, a workshop, although when we get into August, September, what we do on a regular basis, October, schedule workshops for the first week. What's the logic there? I'm, I'm trying to figure this out so I can explain it. The logic of, of reserving the, the last no, three, that, three right, months? Right, but not doing it for the other months. That's my question. So I see it for a good use of the first meeting of the month. If there's not a business agenda well, that what is I, worthy of a meeting. What I was thinking was, you know, we do our, our citizen summit in April. We do our, or not our citizen, our, our strategic plan in April. Uh, we take that to the public the first week of May. And whatever get comes out of that, typically is that's where we get our, our, our workload for the year. And what I was thinking was if, if what comes out of that would be desire of the council to have workshops, then we would be having it there before the end of the year and then address the business. Okay. Well, again, I would hope that if we had something come out of strategic planning, I didn't think it would a workshop in January, February, or March at three months before our next strategic plan, mm -hmm. we'd, I'd want to get it done before sooner than that. Okay. So in, in the sense of a workshop, we talked about the workshops during the last strategic planning session that we had, right? And, and we actually did one on the uh, landscaping ordinance, which is a good example of the type of thing that would uh, be a good, a good use of a, of a workshop. And of course, we have the regular budget workshop. Um, I'm, I'm looking at these other workshops and I'm thinking there are a number of other issues or items that we could address during these workshop meetings, everything from some of the major strategic uh, planning action items that we have for a particular year. Um, whether, whether it be something like um, a website redesign or, or the proactive communication strategy um, that would be useful, not only getting it to us and an update, and I know you could do it individually, uh, but also to the public. And the other reason for doing it at a council meeting is so I get to hear what fellow council members think. Without that, I can't talk to them about any of this stuff. I don't have any idea. And um, so when it comes time to vote on a particular matter regarding that, um, I'm not going to be as well informed as if we workshop this, some of these issues, some of these bigger ones that, uh, that we did identify during the strategic plan. So I see the workshops as an opportunity to kind of keep us up to speed, keep us educated, uh, give us a chance to hear what one another have to say. And then likewise, the audience, uh, the public, whoever it is paying attention, uh, actually gets the opportunity to hear that exchange as well. So. I mean, my preference would be to plan a workshop on the first Thursday of, of, of each month. And if, if there's business that needs to be conducted, adding that, as I think we've talked about, as an option. But then also, uh, if, if there's nothing workshop worthy, then just canceling the meeting at that time. But there are a lot of opportunities through workshops that I, that I, I think we could tap into, including a conversation with county, with TPA, uh, getting some input from them uh, at, at a workshop that might be useful, given all of the attention we're given to transportation, and rightly so, uh, there might be some really good opportunities uh, to, to do that. Mobility planning, no shortage of discussions about that. Uh, and again, all of these things affect us going forward in a big way. So I was just uh, thinking workshops are a good tool. Yeah, like I said, I was, I mean, June is, the kids are usually, the school gets out by the end of May, first week of June. So that was giving, we, we don't have the first week of August because that's the week, the, usually the last week before the kids go back to school. So when I was looking at this schedule um, and knowing that the first week of April, we'll always ha we'll have that meeting because that's a board appointment meeting that we always have. So, uh, you know, what I was looking at was the last half of the year starting, you know, July being the seventh month of the year, we're going to have our workshop there. August we take off, so I put the workshops on all the rest of the months at, throughout the year and, and thought that would be sufficient to, to cover any workshop needs that we have. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to maintain the, the presence and the opportunity for uh, folks to bring us stuff, but also for us to educate one another and then uh, educate the public as we, as we go forward on these issues. So just to clarify, were you suggesting then that we schedule, put workshops as the first Thursday of the month on the calendar, and then if there's nothing to discuss, we cancel them? Is that what you were suggesting? 
what I'm suggesting is that as a placeholder, uh, that we, we put a workshop there. And if there's business to be done, then the business would take priority over a workshop or be added to the workshop, so, which is what we do with the budget hearing or the budget workshop. So just to clarify, if there is a need for an additional meeting, we can always add it, and then we would advertise it publicly based on the time frame that we need to advertise it. Yes, we're going to have a public meeting or at that time. I'd rather do that as we need it versus telling people, oh, we have a, a potential workshop on the first Thursday of the month. There's nothing to discuss when we cancel it. And you have 40 people outside that want to talk to us about something. What's going to draw the business need most likely will be a public hearing. Public hearings are advertised at least you know two weeks in advance. So we'll we, know we most likely will know the, the need for another public, another council meeting at the previous council meeting. Mm -hmm. Which gives them two weeks to Correct. promote it if we need Correct. And it gives you the opportunity to set a special meeting if you needed to. Because you'll, like Correct. like Ray said, you'll know at the last council meeting if you need another council meeting. And then you all, through a majority vote, can set a special meeting for the first Thursday. That's always an option available. And just for clarification, no one's taking vacations in between those two weeks as far as the staff or anything. We're all still accessible, correct? <laughs> okay, <Sorry>. thanks. <laughs> we all have cell phones. We all, all right, so any other comments, input, thoughts? So where does that leave us? Are we look, can we look to get a motion in about at least going forward with this? And I think, I hope everyone's got a comfort level that we're not boxing ourselves into anything. We still have that full flexibility to do the things we want to do when we want to do them. Yeah? And if the need be for additional, we can yeah. add Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for motion. I make a motion to approve um, regular consent agenda item number four with the change that um, the meeting for July would either be the to add the first or second week in July. That only change. Do you mean March? Uh, no. Oh, do you want to do and to add the first meeting in March for 2019? Correct. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. We have a second. 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 All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. Aye. All right, so we have a 3 2 vote. Interesting. Um, Diane, please let the record show that the uh, agenda item number four was approved 3 2 with Hamera and Valentis dissenting. Okay. That, that concludes our agenda for this evening. With no further business before the council, we adjourn. Thank you.